Welcome everyone. Um, uh, it's exciting to be here with you like every week. Uh, we always look forward to this time to connect with the patient community and I see that people are joining the webinar. I'll give everyone a few seconds to join. Um, my name is Sabrina Paganoni and I'm here with Dr. Sukovic and Alison Bulat, our patient navigator for the Healy ALS platform trial. As you know, the Healy LS platform trial is a great community collaboration with many research centers, uh, clinical trial sites, academic partners, industry partners, and great support from so many in the ALS community and so many patient organizations. We're really grateful that everyone is coming together to make the platform trial a success. Uh, and so we, with that in mind, I just wanted to provide some updates about the trial uh, and then also uh, spend most of the time that we have today to answer your questions live. Uh, so feel free to start typing your questions in the Q&A uh, box so that we can take them um, uh, right after the presentation, the short presentation. So if you can move to the next slide. Uh, as, as you know, as a reminder, I know that many of you are following up uh, on a weekly basis, but there's a few new people in the audience today. So just as a brief reminder, uh, and for everyone who, who's new, as you know, the platform trial is a perpetual adaptive trial. So what that means is that we are testing many drugs and we continue to adapt or expand uh, the trial to include more drugs. So at this time, we are testing four drugs. They're listed on the slide, Zalucoplan, Verdiperstat, CNMAU8, and Predoc but we're already working on adding more drugs uh, over the next few weeks and months. Now, the, uh, the trial uh, is a little bit different from a regular standalone trial. Uh, it's a trial that leverages a common infrastructure. That's the platform approach. So we, we built a platform for testing multiple drugs. At this time, again, we're testing four. But because we're leveraging a common or shared infrastructure, we can do something that would not be possible normally in a standalone trial, we can share placebo data. So what that means is that for every drug that we test, we have people on active drug. Uh, most of the people, in fact, go on active drug and only 25% uh, of participants will go on placebo. However, what we can do is to share placebo data across different regimens. And by doing that, we essentially accumulate a shared placebo group that can be used as a comparison for multiple drugs. The randomization ratio is three to one, meaning that for every four people that enter the trial, three will be on active, any of the drugs that are uh, being tested right now, and only one on placebo. Uh, the placebo controlled portion of the trial is six months long. And after that, uh, people who complete the trial will be offered an open label extension. So a participant's journey begins sort of on the left-hand side, as you can see here with the arrows, uh, at the time of informed consent. So what happens is that when somebody expresses interest interest in uh, entering the platform trial, they'll, uh, they'll come in for a screening visit uh, so that they can be properly informed about the trial. Uh, and then uh, if they pass screening, there's some inclusion exclusion criteria for that. Um, and uh, so that they, they will be assigned to any of the available regimen, uh, regimens. At this time, we have four, four drugs. So everyone essentially has a 25% chance of being uh, assigned to regimen A, B, C, or D. And then uh, after that, uh, each participant will be randomly assigned to either active or placebo. Uh, and that's a blind assignment, meaning that people, uh, neither the staff nor the participant will know if they're on active or placebo. Now the placebo control period of the trial, we kept it as short as possible uh, and it's six months uh, or 24 weeks. Uh, when I say as short as possible, I mean uh, as short as, as possible to really be able to tell if the drugs are uh, safe or effective. Really the, the goal of this trial is to determine if all of these drugs are effective in slowing down uh, or um, ALS. And, and basically the trial is, designed so that if one of these drugs had very positive results, meaning they are effective uh, in improving ALS outcomes, then the trial could be served as the one registration trial for that particular drug, again, assuming that the results are, are, are very positive. Now, at the end of the placebo control portion, every participant will be offered the option to go on open label extension. So uh, as the study is still ongoing, obviously we don't enroll all participants at the same time. People come in uh, as they present to the sites. And so it takes a little bit of time to complete the placebo control 
period of the test or the, or the trial uh, until the last participant essentially completes the placebo control period. But in the meantime, we will keep everyone on active drug if they choose to go on active drug so that, uh, again, we, 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 they will be given the option, the opportunity to have access to the drug uh, while we complete the test. And so at the end uh, uh, of, uh, of everyone's uh, follow-up, we will be able to tell if each of these drugs is um, uh, effective or not. If I can go to the next slide, I uh, just wanted to provide an update uh, on the numbers. As of today, over 600 people with ALS have signed informed consent. So that's the beginning of the process, as I just explained. Uh, almost 500 people have been assigned to a regimen uh, and 454 have been randomized within a regimen. Of these people, we already have a great group of 138 individuals that have already completed the placebo control portion of the trial and have entered the open label extension, meaning that they are receiving active drug in, um, in the regimen that they were originally assigned to. Now, the first three regimens, A, B, C, A, A, B and C, were started at the same time. Uh, and so they have roughly the same number of individuals within their regimen. Um, I should have mentioned that we are targeting a total of 160 60 people per regimen. So as you can see here, for B and C, we're almost there. Uh, we really only need 19 more people to be randomized within each of those regimens to achieve the sample size uh, that's uh, required by design, which is 160. Regimen A is also almost there. They're only behind uh, slightly because there is a two week uh, wait period before starting the drug uh, due to a vaccination that's required for the specific regimen. But really, uh, it's, it's essentially, it's, it's going to be closing out at the same time, uh, roughly, uh, of B and C. Now, regimen D is slightly behind simply because it started six months later. It started in early 2021. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, we expect that regimen to catch up as the other ones are filled up. So thank you so much for all of you, uh, for all your support. I know many of you uh, who are on the line are actual participants in the trial or are helping others participate or, or are helping us in terms of advocacy and, and raising awareness and spreading the news. So thank you for all your work. Certainly, we couldn't be doing such a, um, uh, such a big uh, trial with uh, such important goals without all of your participation. And so we can, if we can go to the next slide. Um, a few other notes here. We have 52 sites that are actively enrolling. We will be uh, adding more sites over the next few weeks. Uh, and the list of sites is available on our website. Next slide. And uh, as always, uh, even outside of this webinar, please contact Catherine and Alison, our patient navigation team. If you have any questions about eligibility criteria, sites, communication with sites, or any questions really in general about this program or ALS research, they are with us uh, on these weekly calls uh, and they uh, help us really communicate with so many of you during the week as well. Next slide. So we have uh, a few upcoming guest speakers. We are actually working on scheduling more. So almost every week during the summer, we have a site investigator. It's been so much fun to have uh, a number of guest speakers over the last few weeks. They really uh, bring, you know, um, bring the flavor of their own site to this weekly webinar. Uh, we had, you know, we uh, they share names and, and pictures of their site, and they tell us more about uh, the work that they do uh, with respect to this trial and other research at their site. So next week we will have Dr. Lada from the Barrow Neurological Institute in Arizona. The following week, we will have Dr. Bedlack from Duke University, and we will focus on EAPs as well uh, because of his uh, research interest in that uh, field as well. And then we will have Dr. Weiss and then Dr. Foster, but we're scheduling more. So please um, come and, and, and learn about these sites and, and also spread the news with people who are from those areas so that they might um, connect and we always share um, contact information and other um, helpful tips about those sites as well. Last slide, I think we have one more. And as always, um, we have everything that we do is freely shared and posted on our website. So if you missed any of the previous webinars, uh, if you want to download the slides, uh, if you want to learn more about this, the drugs that we're testing, there's a number of resources on our website, including recordings from previous webinars. Uh, I also want to mention we have uh, we have developed, thanks to Alison and Catherine, our patient navigation team, a number of new resources that are posted on the website. Frequently asked questions about this trial, about research in general, you can check your own eligibility at least high level. Uh, there's a number of other resources, videos, pictures, uh, information. So check out the website and also our previous webinars. And with that, I think we can take your questions. 
Thank you, Sabrina. And thank you, everybody. Uh, we already have several questions. So I'll, we'll just start uh, with the first one. Can you give us an update on um, SLS005 or the CELOS drug? Will this be regimen five of the platform trial? Yeah, that's correct. So we're working on adding this regimen uh, very soon um, in 2021 for sure. Uh, again, in uh, over the next few weeks or months, uh, we will add that to the trial. Yeah. We will have uh, CLOs come here and talk about the science like we did with the other companies, I would say probably in September or so, and, um, and tell you more about the, that regimen. Um, so is there an opportunity for artificial intelligence uh, to help crunch through data to speed up testing? I don't know if you want to talk about origin, maybe. Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. I mean, certainly there's different tools that are being developed in terms of artificial intelligence uh, to screen drugs, uh, to, to, to do more work. Uh, one of the ones that Dr. Sukovic just mentioned is um, some of the um, there's different companies, including the Origin company that does a lot of modeling, statistical modeling to, um, to help with um, um, sort of prediction of results uh, and then comparison to actual results. In fact, we have a partnership with Origin and we will be in some of their methods uh, that again are derived from these complex software and algorithms uh, uh, to, to really uh, help enhance our analysis. So we're working with them as well. Yeah, and I'll just add that, that um, they're working with us as part of a grant that the ALS Association provided to them. So that's another way that they're helping for the platform trial. Um, I was wondering if uh, you can answer this question. Is it possible that in the open label extension of the trial, one of the active drugs could be combined with uh, uh, I think it's AMX035. Yeah, well, uh, so at, at this time, AMX35 is actually still an experimental drug. Uh, however, obviously things might change in the future. Uh, and, and, you know, once uh, a drug is approved by the FDA, uh, that could be allowed, just like Riluzol or Radicava. So again, at this stage, it's still an experimental drug. Uh, so it's not being combined with the other uh, experimental treatments we're testing, but that could change in the future. Thank you. There's a question that um, someone watched the Zaluka plan presentation and saw that they referred to the SOD1 mutation on their animal testing. How would you consider a person with sporadic ALS when you randomize or would Zaluka plan also work for people with sporadic ALS? Yeah, great question. So uh, we expect the Zaluka plan to work uh, for all people with ALS, including people with sporadic disease. And that's true actually for all the drugs that we're testing in the platform trial. Uh, the reason that some of the preclinical experiments for Zaluka plan and other drugs as well have been done in the SOD1 mouse model is because that's a very common and well characterized model of ALS. There's more than one model. Certainly we want to look at results in multiple models. Uh, but again, that's just one of the models that are available. That does not mean it's only restricted to that particular uh, gene. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. We expect the results that have been seen in several preclinical models to uh, kind of be um, representative or relevant for all forms of ALS. Thank you. Um, so there's a question about our numbers. And I don't know if maybe Molly, um, if you could pull back the slides for the, uh, the slide where we have our enrollment numbers. Um, but I'll read the question in the meantime. Uh, so with 637 with informed consent and 454 randomized, are there already enough participants with informed consent to fill regimen A, B, C, and almost all of D? And so maybe answer, answer that. Yeah, yeah, so I we had several questions in during these webinars about math. I, I must admit I'm not the best <laughs> math person, but I'll try to take this question. Yeah. So essentially, you know, just kind of high level. Uh, yes, you're, you're correct. We have over 600 people that have signed in from consent. However, uh, some people may not be eligible for the trial. I believe it's about 100 people so far. They have not be, uh, have been found not to be eligible for the trial. For example, they might have um, other medical problems or other reasons for not being eligible. Uh, and so uh, really the, the number I think that we want to look at is really the 499, um, you know, soon to be 500, I'm sure, uh, of individuals that were assigned to a regimen. So those are the people that have signed informed consent and have found to be eligible and therefore they were already assigned to a regimen. So that's the number of people really that are certainly in, in terms of um, uh, being eligible and have been assigned to a regimen. Now there might be a few more that are in screening, uh, but again, that's sort of, you know, the number of people that we know for sure, essentially uh, almost 500 that are assigned. Um, and, and you're right, uh, you know, we, we certainly, we are making excellent progress in terms of reaching the enrollment goals, uh, but, uh, but again, we still have spots 
lots. So please, um, you know, connect with sites because we are, um, you know, uh, even when we fill up uh, A, B, and C, again, we have to complete D. And also, uh, as mentioned previously, uh, we have E or the Silos regimen coming up very soon. So I expect to always have spots, um, again, for patients who want to participate. Thank you. Um, so there's a question about uh, whether, uh, get our opinion on this. Congress has recently taken an inc increased interest in the FDA. Do you think this will help, hurt, or have no effect on new ALS drug submissions? Maybe you answer first, I'm happy to answer. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a, a strong opinion on this. Um, so, because uh, I think, again, it's uh, it, it's important that different players uh, are interested in ALS, and I think the more awareness there is, uh, the better, but I don't know of a direct effect. I don't know if, if you have any thoughts on this. I think, well, it could go either way or, or be neutral. I think on one hand, getting Congress involved to get more resources to the FDA for you know, um, initiatives in ALS would be a very good thing. And obviously there are some acts in front of Congress and for them to understand the challenges and to create the policies that exist in other illnesses like cancer for ALS and Alzheimer's and Parkinson's would be a very good thing. So I think that would be a good outcome. I think a not good outcome, and I don't want to get in trouble and say anything political, is I don't think we should have Congress telling the FDA what to do about approvals of drugs. I mean, that, but, but, if they can create more resources and, and pathways and encourage acceleration, that would be a really good thing. But I don't think we want Congress picking which drugs get approved or not. So it depends how involved they get. But hopefully it'll be on the positive. Uh, so the question is, if, uh, if you end up in the emergency room, um, who will cover the costs? And I'll just say, hopefully we don't want anybody to end up in the emergency room for this, but it's a very good question. Yeah, absolutely. So if somebody were to have a medical emergency or a medical problem, whether it results directly from participation or not, uh, that's medical care. So uh, the, the insurance, the health insurance will be billed as usual uh, when, when somebody has a medical problem. Now, uh, I would say that if there are uh, bills, extra bills like copays uh, or other extra costs that will be charged to the participant, uh, then we will make every effort to cover those costs. And and, and there's provisions for that uh, that are discussed at the informed consent process. Yeah. I have to say, having done studies now for a very long time, I've, I've never seen insurance not cover it for if there's someone, if something happens. Um, right. Uh, so there's um, a question that says, thank you for the webinar. Do I understand correctly that the placebo control portion of the trial is limited to six months? No one receives placebo for more than six months. Um, and this person's attending uh, today on behalf of a friend that was recently diagnosed. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, placebo is no more than six months. And then everyone who finishes the, the six month period has the option to enter the open label extension, which means receiving active drug. And there's a question about a very new um, paper that came out that showed um, mutations in a gene called TP-73, TP not to be confused with TTP-73, 43. <laughs> that was identified recently and how it impacts apoptosis. I'm happy to answer a little yeah. bit. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That. Yeah. Um, so, you know, every new discovery is just like another piece of this giant puzzle that's being filled in. So this, I think, is really good news. There are some gene mutations that, that definitely cause the illness, like SOD1 or the C9 or 72 mutations. And then there's other ones that increase your risk of getting the disease. And this is in that category. So it's, if someone carries this gene, it's not a guarantee that you will get ALS, but it increases your risk for it. There's another gene like that um, you know, called the taxin 2. So this was recently found. It's, it's rare. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not found in many people with ALS, but it's an important gene in the pathway of how um, your cells handle um, injury and how they might um, uh, then kind of apoptosis is something called self-suicide. So it, and they, the scientists figured out ways using CRISPR, which is, you know, this new, new gene editing approach to kind of fix that defect. So I think it's really important as another target for treatments, just like the uh, taxin uh, two mutation, which is in about two or 3% of people with sporadic illness has led to a treatment and trial for sporadic disease. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see something like that using gene therapy for this target. But it's brand new, just came out. So we're all learning about it, um, but it's great science. Um, is, uh, Sabrina, is the regimen a patient 
is assigned to random or does it relate to what stage of the disease the patient is in? So uh, it's random. So essentially right now we have four uh, treatment, uh, possible treatment assignments. So every participant will have 25% chance of being into any of these um, four. Okay. Will the designation of predopidine as an orphan drug in Europe have any impact on the trial? Yeah, I, I don't think there's going to be any direct impact. Obviously, you know, we, we are happy to see that, uh, you know, that, that there's, there's interest in the drug, uh, not only in the US, but also in Europe. So I think, again, uh, different drugs uh, in the trial uh, or that are being considered have that designation, and, and that's good news. Yeah, I think it really helps companies uh, and it helps the field get um, extra help from regulatory groups and, and, and speed tracks. So it's always good when they get it. I have to say that almost every drug for ALS gets orphan drug um, status, you know, because it's really based on the number of people with the illness. So it's it's good news, but it's, it's not unique to that drug. Um, this is a good question. Um, and uh, I, I'm not sure I know the answer. I'll see if you know, which is what percentage of people have enrolled in open label extension versus continue to stay on the regimen? Uh, yeah, I don't tell the exact number. I can tell tell you it's the overwhelming majority of people that have uh, completed the placebo control trial. They have opted to stay in the open label extension. Uh, now people can also decide to stay in the open label extension for a little bit and then change their mind. So it's not sort of a long-term commitment, but it's an option. Uh, and then people either right after the end, the placebo control period, or after some time of participation into the open label extension, they can try to be re to re-enter the trial. Essentially, they still have to be eligible for that. But if they are, they can uh, re-enter the trial either from the very end of the placebo control period or some some time, um, you know, into the OLE. We can definitely maybe uh, start presenting that data too, but I, yeah. I agree with Sabrina, it's, it's, it's a majority. So what type of biomarkers are being analyzed in the Healy platform trial? And what will it take for one of these biomarkers to be accepted as a surrogate endpoint in the trial? You know, we have the ALSFRS, but it's not perfect. Yeah, no, that's a great question. In fact, one of the goals of the trial is to develop new surrogate biomarkers. And that's why we are getting all these uh, plasma samples, urine samples, and optional spinal fluid samples to do exactly what you're suggesting, to develop a new surrogate biomarker that could help uh, not only this trial, but uh, the entire field. So at this stage, we are, um, first of all, taking a lot of uh, samples from participants, and, and definitely we're really grateful for all these donations. Uh, we are planning to test um, several biomarkers, specifically in all participants. We're planning on testing neurofilament levels, different types of neurofilaments, as well as P75. Uh, that's for everyone. Now, we also have other biomarkers that are specific to the drug because they're meant to be signs of response to a specific drug. So, for example, the leukoplan will have its own, vertiprestal will have its own, and so forth. Um, so, uh, so, whether, so, hopefully, we'll be able able to uh, detect, identify, and really characterize both general ALS biomarkers as well as markers of response to specific drugs. Uh, and certainly that's a, an area of a high interest. We're also working in collaboration with many scientists to think about options for genetic testing as well as additional biomarkers as they are developed. Um, so in terms of what it will take, uh, I think that the best way to, to really validate a biomarker would be to have a positive drug where we can see a clear signal. So that's why we have, to, you kind of have to do this sort of, you know, um, plan it, uh, hoping that, that again, if we see a positive effect, then we will be able to go back and really correlate the, the biomarker levels with the effect of the drug. I want to add that, you know, some, um, we don't know whether the best surrogate is going to be uh, a blood biomarker or something in the spinal fluid or a digital one, like a, a voice or a home app. So we have to collect broadly. Um, in this study, we, we did make the spinal tap for spinal fluid uh, optional. And I think about 10% of participants have, have, have agreed to do that and are doing that, which is wonderful. But that might be something that we want going forward to try to maybe increase a little bit because it might be that we really need those type of measures to, to get a good circuit. Um, there's a question related to the genetics um, that you mentioned. Would you recommend genetic testing for all PALS? Um, with the hope that more people get tested um, that might result in some pattern recognition. 
this is a great question. And I think our thinking continues to evolve. At this time, I think that in the clinic, uh, I think it's advisable to at least consider genetic testing for, um, you know, if not all the vast majority of, of people for two reasons. Number one, you know, we're learning a lot about genetics. We're finding that even people who don't have a family member that's affected might carry a gene. Uh, and uh, there are now uh, different trials that are targeting specific genes. So for a number of reasons, it can be helpful in the clinic. Uh, in terms of this specific trial, we are actually uh, collecting DNA, uh, genetic information from everyone. Uh, it's actually optional, but I would say the overwhelming majority of people are participating in that optional DNA collection to essentially do what you're suggesting, to do pattern recognition. So let's say that if we see some drugs that are positive and, and have an effect on the ALS, uh, you know, on ALS outcomes, then we will be able to go back and try to link it to uh, the corresponding genetic uh, change, uh, again, because we're going to have the DNA uh, available to do that type of analysis. Thank you. It's a question about whether AMX035 has entered phase three clinical trial uh, testing yet. Yeah, the, the trial, the phase three trial uh, is being launched as we speak. Literally, uh, we uh, the, the startup phase is ongoing and I expect the first few participants in this global trial uh, to be enrolled over the next few weeks uh, or months, but certainly a very, actively, a very active trial right now. There's um, two questions about the expanded access, so I might combine them. Uh, one is that, that they understand IMALS gave a grant for uh, expanded access for one of the first three regimens. Can you please help people understand why it was not for all of them? And then another question really about any updates we have on starting the expanded access program. Yeah, so, so first of all, we, we want to create an, an expanded access companion for uh, all of the drugs that are part of the platform trial. So uh, we are working uh, essentially on multiple programs. Uh, I would say that for regimen B, that was sort of the first that we started with, uh, uh, but, but that doesn't mean that we're not working on the other ones. So again, there was this one grant opportunity from IMALS and we applied for the first, you know, with the first industry partner, I guess, that, that was willing to, to give drug, but the other ones are also working on this. So in terms of the updates, I expect the first person um, in the deeper start regimen B expanded access program to be enrolled uh, very soon, any day really now. Uh, and then um, that will be followed over the next few weeks for the other ones. Yeah, yeah, I'll say that the uh, because of the amount and the size of the grant, uh, it, was, it was really only uh, enough for one of them. And then um, that company also donated the drug quickly and some matching funds. So it was the obvious one to start with, but we're going to do them for for, all, for at least three of the four um, and then try to really make it a requirement for all the ones going forward as well. Uh, another question really relates to expanded access, which is about the a act for ALS. If that becomes law, is the Healy Center ready to start writing grants to get some more money for expanded access? I know it's premature because it hasn't passed yet, but um, please give us your thoughts there. I think you're right. Uh, I think we're already thinking about that. Uh, obviously, we need to see if the law passes, but that would be a great opportunity. And certainly, we would want to leverage that opportunity to expand the expanded access options. Yeah. There's a question about the participants getting their DNA results. Uh, if you could, uh, the question is, when would they? Yeah, so, so at this time, we're not planning on um, sharing the DNA results uh, because this is um, this DNA that's been analyzed as part of this specific trial uh, is, uh, is done on a research basis. Uh, and because at the same time, um, the, the clinical DNA results, the clinical um, uh, test has become much more available. And there's actually a number of programs now where people can do it for free in the clinic. Uh, so uh, we, we felt we would keep them separate because the logistics of returning uh, DNA results in the context of a clinical trial would have actually been a barrier to the trial. Uh, and again, people can get their clinical testing done now essentially for free. There's a number of programs. So feel free to talk to your doctor if uh, you haven't had access to that program yet. Uh, it's possible to do in the clinic essentially for free now. Yeah, so there are, um, back to the Act for ALS, uh, there's two people wrote in that there's 272 co-sponsors in the house. They need 290, so they're well on the way, which is fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, there's a question about whether sporadic ALS could also be a result of a gene mutation, or is it just the case for familial? 
Now, that's a great question. So we are learning more and more, uh, again, as the genetic testing becomes more available. Uh, there's, in fact, a few people that do not have family members affected that, um, that are actually found to have uh, genetic changes um, in, in their DNA. Uh, and again, as we discover more genes, we know of more cases. Uh, and sometimes it's not an actual disease causing mutation, but it could be one of the genes that were briefly mentioned earlier that could increase the risk of having ALS. Um, so uh, we got to almost every question, but not all of them, so I'm sorry about that, but we'll uh, keep the ones we didn't get to and answer them next week. Um, but and hopefully all of you will join us again next week. Thank you, Sabrina and Alison. Thank you. And Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a good weekend.